You're listening to 99.1 WQRT LP Indianapolis, and this is Create Here. Produced by artists and curators from Big Car Collaborative, Create Here is your place to listen to conversations with people making intriguing, innovative, and impactful things happen on the cultural front in Indianapolis, Indiana, and beyond. Find out more and access additional episodes at WQRT.org. In this episode, I interview photographer and publisher Chris Graves. Chris Graves creates artwork that deals with societal problems and aims to use art as a means to inform people about cultural issues. He also works to elevate the representation of people of color and the fine art canon, and to create opportunities for conversation about race, representation, and urban life. Graves creates photographs of landscapes and people to preserve memory. Graves has been published and exhibited globally, including Museum of Modern Art New York, Getty Institute Los Angeles, and National Portrait Gallery in London, England, among others. I'm Oreo Jones here with Chris Graves. Yo, what's up? What's poppin'? Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Hey, thank you for coming and stopping by and taking a look at our neighborhood. Of course. I mean, Garfield Park, what up? Um, I just, you know, I'm staying like two houses down, so I feel yeah. like I've been look, looking at the listen here from the window. Like, <laughs> what's in there? What is that? I'm glad to glad to be here. Next to the Compassion Center, yeah, which is also a, two great names for buildings right next to yeah. each other. Dig it. Very iconic spots here in the neighborhood. Mm-hmm. You're a photographer. Yes, a photographer. Artist. I, I'm a publisher. I have two publishing companies. I run a, now I run an, well, I am the curator for an NFT photography company. Nice. So there's a lot of stuff going on for sure. So why don't you tell everyone out there in Radio Land what you're doing here in the city mm. of Indianapolis? So I have a residency here and I'm staying at the Tube Factory. Guy Clark Gallery uh, has me at their Airbnb upstairs, which is beautiful. Like feels really like I'm home which is great. And I'm here with a residency program named Aurora Photo Center, Mm -hmm. Aurora Photo Center, which runs out of Indianapolis, run by Mary Goodwin and um, her team. I don't know them. I haven't met them yet, but I'm sure I will soon. Marie Goodwin, I should say, not Mary, because I think she'll be mad at me. So Marie Goodwin. That's the queen's coming out. All of that. (laughs) All of that. Yeah, yeah. I went to like, uh, I went to a, a Catholic school that was named that. So it gets me like, Cool. Anyway, I my memory. Um, yeah, so I'm here to make photographs. Pretty much, I'm I'm on a like a shortened residency program. Uh, sadly, COVID has been like a little rough, but I've been able to make some portraits, so I'm feeling really good. I use these color changing LED light bulbs to kind of put. Usually, I put like people of color in colors, mm-hmm. so they have some sort of you know agency for not being in white light all the time, maybe or mm-hmm. something like that. So yeah, I feel like that's a, a an element that. People don't really talk about just the lighting in general, especially photographing people of color. And I feel like in the past few years, in photography, especially it's, and cinematography and movies, it's it's I'm, it's definitely being more explored. And mm-hmm. I think I made my first portraits, and then I saw that it was being like pre- repro- like kind of that kind of style is being reproduced in a lot of cinema, mm-hmm. meaning like moonshot, moonshine, not moonshine, moonlight. Uh, moonlight yeah. did a really good job at using colored light on on black skin, so mm-hmm. that was like really great to see. They took it to another level, and a bunch of photographers have now like incorporated that color into black skin, which is like mm-hmm. really cool to see. I, I wish I got some credit for that, but I'll you know it's fine. <laughs> I can just continue to be a hater my whole life, you know. <laughs> So uh, why don't you let everyone know how you like got into photography mm-hmm. and like kind of like the beginning. Let's take it back a little yeah, bit. Yeah, yeah. So I remember, well, first off, I, I don't like school, but I did go to school. Uh, in middle school, you know, in, in like lower education, meaning not lower education, but like pr- like first grade to 12th grade, I was always interested in art most. So I wanted to do something artistic. Mm-hmm. I didn't want to be in history. I didn't real. I didn't think that there would be a job in science or math for me. Or mm-hmm. English was definitely like, what does a job in English mean? So for me, I was like, I'm good at art. I'm at least decent. I know that I'm not good because there's people that are better than me by far at this at my high school. So I know there's people better than me in the world for sure. But photography was like, man, well, that's that's an art form where you can actually make a living, right? The other art forms, it was like, you can't make a solo living off of painting or drawing usually you have to be super lucky but with photography there's a ton of photographers working there's photos everywhere magazines like billboards um art side uh, there, there's photo everywhere so i was like there's at least something for me there and then i asked my parents to get me a camera they were like no um <laughs> so i was like okay well i'll just start thinking about it and figure out how to like get into it so in when i 
got into 11th grade, I realized that we had like a photo program at our high school that, and the professor was really nice. He was like, yeah, you can come in. Even if you're not in the class, you can just come in and learn how to use a dark room. You can have a camera and use it during class hours if you have like a free period or something like that. So I went in, got a little 35 millimeter film camera and started to learn how to develop in the dark room, like chemicals and stuff. So that was the introduction and it never stopped from there. I mean, I went to a college a state school in New York named Purchase College, which is about 20 miles north of uh, uh, the city where I'm, where I'm living. And 20 miles maybe not even 20 miles i mean it's probably it's probably closer than that it's not far it was far enough for my parents that it was well you know you want to be away from your parents a little bit for school kind of i did but i wanted to be able to go home still i applied for purchase and i applied for three like private schools the private schools were like you know at that point in the year 2000 when i was applying it was like five thousand or sorry 30 grand a year to go to like a private school yeah, that's, that's not including living right yeah. so i was like my parents. And that's I mean, in 2000. Like, that was in the year 2000. It was wow. $28,000 to go to SVA School of Visual Arts in the year 2000 just for like going to school. Also, Purchase seemed like the best program. Even though it was a state school, it had the best professors. They were consistent. They had like tenured staff. And the other places had like less tenured staff. Mm-hmm. And you'd have to be dealing a lot with... Um, what I'll say is that the, the reason I really went to Purchase is because I interviewed at Purchase with an artist. And at the other schools, I interviewed in an office with like a dean or like some... Mm-hmm. like administrator and i was like this is not i'm not going to school to be with with an administrator who gets mm-hmm. lets me in or not it doesn't seem fair or it doesn't seem fair so i was like if an artist lets me into this program they at least know that i have potential mm-hmm. or something so that made me pick that school that's what's up and it was also a perfect day right it was a snowy ass day my mom drove me up to the school I was like, it's like it looks like a, a prison it was just all brown brick the whole campus same brick it was like consistent it felt like just weird and artsy to me. Like, and that same night was like the first day I ever went to like a concert. So I was like, cool. it was like a big day for me. <laughs> what concert was it? Oh man, I think it was like Snowcore Tour 2000 or something. <laughs> like, I don't know. I think Puya. Oh I don't know wow! If you remember yeah. Puya. Yes, of course. Puya yeah. Incubus. Wow. I think. Uh, well, damn. Was it? I think Mr. Bungle. Wow. Mr. Bungle, which is like Mike Patton's band from back then. Oh my God, so good. And. uh I had two concerts two days in a row at the same venue named Roseland in New York, which R.I.P. Roseland. That was like mm. the best place to see a show. It was like just big enough. Cool. And the mosh pits were quite nice. That's what's up. But yeah, I, I saw a lot there. And it was just a good day. I was like, damn, I get to go to college and then I can get on this train and go to the concert and then like, yeah. and I can keep doing that. Like this 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 uh, school is close to those concerts. So I just kept going to concerts for the cool. four years I was at Purchase. It was, it was a good it was a good way. That's what's up. So that's how I started with photo because I wasn't good at anything else really. Yeah. It's like I couldn't real I couldn't realize myself as anything besides an artist. So fast forward after your secondary education, would you recommend going to school as an artist? Artists that are coming up that are trying to get established like yourself, mm-hmm. what what would you essentially Am I established? I mean, I'll take it. I mean, I've done so much traveling, you know, (laughs) I've done so much myself, like building my own career that of course people have helped me along the way a lot, but I feel like I have, I don't think if you have motivation, you don't need the school, right? Like if you actually can motivate yourself to do something like, and it's usually just educate yourself, right? You have to, I was buying photography books pretty early on. As soon as I had $30, I'd buy new books to to learn like from somebody who did it before me to try to figure out like what they were doing, what worked, what I didn't like, how I could change that. If I was, you know, in the field, like maybe I was looking at a lot of landscape and arch- landscape architecture, urban, mm-hmm. urban landscape type stuff at the beginning. So I was just trying to figure out like, what are they doing that works for me? And then figuring out how do I incorporate that into my own art? Making money, however, was like secondary for like the art. I think that that's the one thing that um, school, my school taught me how to do is to make art primary and make money secondary. And because they didn't teach you how to get a job in photography, like mm. my, nobody in my school knew how to get a job in photography after graduating. Mm. That's a little different than a lot of other colleges. They teach you how to like get a job in photography, which I would have hated. I think that would, that's not the type of education I wanted. I wanted to learn from the artists. So I would say you have to know where you're going. Do the research. Make sure that it feels right to you. See what those professors at the school are doing outside of the school. And if that interests you. Talk to them before you go and see if you want to talk to them for four years, you know, Mm -hmm. that's important. So I would say yes and no. Like if you have the drive and you have mentors that can help you through it, then maybe you don't need education. 
Hmm. Education costs a lot of money. It seems like it costs too much money these days, right? Like, I would tell no one to spend 100 I mean, grad school, think about that. If you yeah. asked me, like, would I go to grad school, I'd say, fuck no. I mean, <laughs> yeah. if you asked me if I went to grad school, like, should I go to grad school, I'd say, nah, you can't do that. That's like, unless you're trying to get something very specific out of it, then grad school seems like, to me, a lot of money that you're probably, it's going to take a long time to get back. Unless you start to get really creative with how to make your, your living. Motivation 101 is is the best class you could take, huh? Education is free on the internet, and I think that it's become so good in the past, like, 20 years. I mean, when I was in college in 2000, there was no YouTube. You couldn't, mm-hmm. like, actually learn anything from, like, a photographer. Like, you had to look at books. But now, you can go online and talk. T- you can hear a hundred of the best photographers in the world talk about their craft and figure out, like, what, like why they make work. And I think mm-hmm. that's invaluable. If I had that in college, I'd be 10 times ahead of where I am now, I think. Mm-hmm. So use the internet and then see if you want to use the college. Yeah. Let's talk about the work. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about your work. Yeah. Beautiful landscapes, portraits with a social message. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think be- beautiful landscapes is a, is very, thank you for saying that. I think that what I'm trying to do is be really hard on the American landscape with what I, with mm-hmm. what I work on. Like I've been in the South a lot lately photographing every confederate monument i could yeah. i could find so i went on a road trip with national geographic last year covid was last year right it was, no yeah. that was two, 2020 well, it's all yeah. these years now yeah, actually. It is. Yeah, in 2020 all, they're all blending together <laughs> in 2020 i went on this long road trip with national geographic with a friend of mine named marshall and we pretty much went for 25 days over 4,000 miles to photograph every confederate and racist monument and school named after a racist or confederate that we could find in eight states in the south Right. So that was in the middle of COVID. There was a lot of, you know, it was COVID. It was like August, September of like the rush of COVID in the South. And we were out just making photographs. I mean, to me, it was like a more of a, that was more documentary than I usually do. Usually I'm in New York or other cities trying to find slices of the American problem, Mm -hmm. meaning like gentrification, climate change, um, infrastructure issues, and people stuck within those things. That's kind of Mm -hmm. what I focus on. So I don't go for beauty. I'd probably go for like complicated. Mm -hmm. And if it has some beauty in it, that's just because I got lucky. Yeah. Or that's the one you saw because I probably make 50,000 pictures and you get to see 10. That's pretty much how I do it. Mm -hmm. Let's, let's talk about the Southern horror series a Mm -hmm. little bit. So we saw that in 2020, the sort of, I feel like virtue signaling type scenarios going across the country where they're taking down the monuments. Yeah. They're, you know, like trying to pacify, like, yeah. mm-hmm. you know, all these these monuments that came up around after you know, around the Jim Crow era, mm-hmm. totally 1912, uh, the, you know, right when the when the Klan was pretty dominant here, mm-hmm. erected uh, or actually moved uh, a monument to Garfield Park for the monument was to honor Confederate soldiers that were that died in a, a Union prison camp here in Indianapolis, mm-hmm. which was taken down in 2020 uh not too long ago yeah I mean, yeah i just missed it yeah i was looking at in like pictures and i was like oh i'm gonna photograph that too Great. so so i guess what i'm saying is or what, what I'm, I'm trying to wonder is you were down in the south you were actually documenting all of this stuff what did you gather from just the communities and the people you're around and like how was how potent was that when you were in these spaces and taking a glimpse of of, of this happening in real time. Yeah, it's, well, first off, um, there's two different kind of, uh, sections of that, com- like that Confederate South, right? There's yeah. one, like the Southern horror specifically is 175 images of Confederate monuments and schools and stuff like that from all across the South. But there's also the, the monuments that are being taken down, right? That's a whole different, that is a whole different thing. Like those, those monuments being like thrown into rivers, painted on like graffiti on mm-hmm. and like just, hopefully destroyed and now some of the most of them are gone but that southern horror series is things that are just going to be there forever right like until i don't know who comes and like thinks about taking them down but those are in towns that are republican Mm -hmm. and yeah pretty red i mean it's just even though there's black people all around they're still become red towns because it's all like gerrymandered and Mm -hmm. and they'll never be down you'll be able to go i mean there was one trip in georgia where you drive from atlanta to Augusta, which is an hour and a half drive on the highway, but we found 18 Confederate monuments 
just off the highway, just kind of going up and down the highway zigzagging. And it took us nine hours for an hour and a half drive to, to photograph all these monuments because there's so many of them. Yeah. So it's going to be a long time before those things are gone. I, my family's from Montgomery, Alabama. So I had a lot of stories about, like, I have cousins that went to schools named after Confederates that wish they went to schools named after black people in the mm-hmm. same town. My uncle is part of one of the first Selma riots. Or, I mean, sorry, this one of the first Selma marches, the second Selma march, um, because there was three of them on that same weekend, I believe. Mm-hmm. And, like, he remembers that, being a kid doing that 45-mile, like, walk on the highway from Selma to Montgomery. And I photographed all that. And it's like you're walking along cotton fields, right? Like, there's still cotton fields today on that road. So I can't imagine what it looked like in 19, like, 60s yeah. or 50, 60s when that was occurring. And a kid and a whole bunch of his community and friends doing the same thing as kids, children. It's crazy. To, I mean, it's just wild to even imagine. Um, we, I have friends from South Carolina, same thing. They're like, yeah, we grew up with that down the block. That huge Confederate monument has been like a stain on this whole neighborhood for, mm-hmm. for all of time. And it continues to be. You know, mm-hmm. So there's a lot of stories like that. I mean, I was walking down the street in South Carolina. I mean, I have a lot of stories. I mean, I was walking down the street in South Carolina in Charleston. Beautiful city. It's like one of the more beautiful cities I've yeah, ever it's seen. Beautiful, yeah. But it's like the racism is like inert. I mean, or it is just like built into the fabric of the place. Yeah. Everywhere is sort of like kind of wrong. I was walking down the street with my friend, white dude, my friend, and a guy on a bike just like kind of rode his bike past us. Just did we, we were just walking. He said, Jacob Blake's murder was justified and just kept riding his bike past us. And I was like, first off, I had to be like, who's Jacob Blake? Right, because it hap- that happened when we were on the road shooting, so I w- we weren't actually looking at the news like that. Like we were looking at Confederate news, but not like the the current news. So that was weird to hear. Like, oh, thanks for that. I mean, why why was that necessary for you to tell some random people on the street? Like, mm-hmm. that's the kind of stuff we were dealing with a lot in the South. Mm-hmm. Like, my my friend would have to stay with, in the car with it on in some of these neighborhoods because I had to make these pictures pretty quickly. Like people yeah. staring at us from across the street in their houses when I'm photographing a very private confederate monument across yeah. the street from them like through some trees and a hundred feet away with a zoom lens kind yeah. of so we saw some stuff we felt some stuff it, it almost never felt that safe the cities felt more safe mm-hmm. um just because there's a lot of people around but yeah but yeah it's, it's tough times it's a wild medium to photography i going to these spaces and you're literally going and you're shooting you're 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 mm-hmm. clipping images and you're in other people's zones <laughs> Yep. And and with social media and technology over the years and stuff, like people are always skeptical, even when you're like in a restaurant or somewhere, just like, you're you're it's a very abrasive mm-hmm. medium. And I use a, a very a kind of a large camera and a tripod all the time on these shoots. So I yeah. know I'm getting something proper. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it brings way more attention, like. I photographed like 30 schools named after Confederates in the States. Mm. And it's like, I'm on school property photographing a school with a big camera and a tripod mm. while school's in session. That's wild. So now I'm like, okay, now I'm in actually like danger mode. Like yeah. I could just get cops to pull up to us and that would be a, that would be a problem. Yeah. So yeah, it was, we were quick. Mm-hmm. But sometimes we were very quick. Like we'd scout the scene beforehand, like really quickly, like just ri- drive by something and see like what I can make a picture of at the location. Cause sometimes Again, you're seeing some random stuff you've not really seen before. You've seen it in a Google map or like a street view. Yeah, and yeah. you're like, how am I going to make this photograph in real life? And sometimes you get mm-hmm. you can get a good one. Sometimes they're more documentary than anything else. Like you're photographing a sign that has a Confederate name on it instead yeah. of like something actually beautiful and interesting. So that's why it's more documentary series, that Southern Horror. Right. Um, but we're going to put it across the street at... Uh, how did you pronounce the gallery? Guy Clark. Guy Clark. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Guy Clark Gallery is going to have the show of all of them. So we're going to just fill a room with 175 8 by 10 inch prints, and there will be floor to ceiling in that gallery wow. space. So you can be surrounded by it like we were. Wow. And that's February 4th. I'm rapping with photographer, publisher, Chris Graves. Was it always a mission when you started to find yourself within this world to focus on social issues or document, I mean, almost being kind of like a photojournalist type Mm -hmm. scenario, or did it kind of happen naturally where you're like, these are things that need to be addressed and need to be shown to the masses? I actually don't consider myself a photojournalist at all. I think that the photojournalism, like people... 
people are really good at that. Like, try, like, like Gordon Parks. Like, I, I mean, that's my that's my love right there. Yeah. Like, that's like my favorite number one of all time. Like, dude, like that's the first person I ever. Um, Gordon Parks is the first photographs I ever saw and was like, oh yeah, breathtaking. I, I can be a photographer. This yeah. is like some work that makes me feel different about life. Right. So that was first. Eugene Smith as well, but Gordon Parks primarily. So I. I guess he did some documentary work also, but he was working with art pretty early on. I mean, American Gothic, his his photograph with the uh, with uh, I forgot her name in front of that American flag with the with the broom, at, like her cleaning, like and then going home to deal with her four kids by herself. Kind of that series is documentary like one one. I think people should see that if they want to be a documentary photographer. If they haven't seen that, then they're probably like not doing their job in research. Um, for me, I didn't want to work that way. I wanted to be a little bit more on the art side. Like I'd like my practice to be in between documentary and conceptual art, so something in between where you, there's still a story there, but it may not be obvious. Mm-hmm. Like this, yeah, you'd, you'd have to look at this picture and say, like, well, I see that there's a problem. What is that problem? Is that a problem? Do I feel like that's a problem? Like I want you to look within to see, like, if you really can see the problem there. And if you don't see the problem, then then you, there's something going on with you that. <laughs> That's how I feel. I'm trying to make. I'm, I'm like the hater of photography. It's like I want to give you something that's really beautiful, that's super problematic. And if you don't see the problems or you can't figure the problems, then it's tough. I mean, like that. That's on you, right? Like I've made this, but I haven't always made work like this. I started to make work like this um, when I saw black people being murdered on camera by police officers, like in 2014, 15, and that's when I started to switch my like switch. Like from just making landscapes of wherever I was in the world as a black person to like, what does it feel like to be a black person within the world? Like that was the switch. That was the changeover. I've not actually really thought about it until right now, but that's, that's why I switched the landscape mode. Cause I was, I was happy making really wonderful, beautiful landscapes that mm-hmm. I thought were wonderful. Mm-hmm. They didn't have anything to do with black culture or any kind of culture. Yeah. They were just like, I am here. No other black person I know or I've never seen a black person photograph here before in like Iceland or like driving around Iceland and photographing only things that were accessible. Mm-hmm. Like that's what was my job was like for me, mm-hmm. because I realized that when you see pictures of Iceland, you're seeing like really grand, beautiful spaces that you can't really access as a regular person. Like mm-hmm. if you have any sort of like disability or like any, anything like that, you're seeing a picture that you just have no access to. Mm-hmm. So for me, I wanted to make a, a series of work in another place that was so beautiful that you could actually get to within a half of a mile of walking no matter what. Mm. That was the idea behind that trip. Like, do things that you can drive to that still look incredible, that are unbelievable, and then you give somebody a, a guide to going back to those places. Mm. So, yeah, it switched over a little bit. That's what's up. You mentioned your series about black people murdered by police officers could you touch a mm-hmm. little bit on on that series yeah so that series in particular that is called a bleak uh well yeah i did a few series like this but the the landscape series i did on this was called the bleak reality yeah and i got hired actually by um vanity fair of all people to photograph locations around america where me and uh, uh, a photo editor from vanity fair thought about or we were trying to think about an idea for like what like kind of a black lives matter type of story for for their for their online paper that was named Hive. Yeah, so what was it? Yeah, I we turn like at the end of the day we were like I want to go I pretty much told them I wanted to go to eight locations where black people were killed by police officers. And they kind of happened to be all on the Mississippi River or east of. So it was kind of this trip where I still had a day job. I worked at I worked at the Guggenheim Museum for 11 years as the photographer as one of the photographers. Every weekend I'd go to like three places. Like so I to make these pictures at the exact same time as when the men died. Uh, so, you know, one weekend I'd go from, I'd leave on a Friday and hit like South Carolina. That was the first time I went to Charleston, photograph there and then take a plane same day, go to like, uh, Minneapolis photograph there at the, at, at night and then leave the next morning and photograph Cleveland and then do the three. So I did like eight in like three weekends, eight mm-hmm. photographs over across the like Eastern United States in eight and three weekends and then had that story. Mm-hmm. But that story is strange because it's like, I'm photographing places where somebody was murdered, right? Yeah. Seven were on public property. One was on private. The private property was a little bit, you know, sketchy because I was like, somebody just died here like a few months ago and now I'm here photographing it. Like, Mm -hmm. why, why would I not get, you know, the same deal? So that was a hard shot. I mean, that was in New York was the kind of toughest part because I remember being in in Brooklyn 
And we were like, me and my friend were there making photographs in the middle of this big street, Linden Boulevard. I'm from Queens, and Linden Boulevard stretches from Brooklyn to Queens. And so I knew it from my childhood, but this is a tough part of it, right? It's always been a, a tough, tough section of Brooklyn. And yeah, we heard gunshots and like a bunch of gunshots, like across the street. And we were just didn't move. I was like, it was the first time I was like, okay, well, we're not running with the gunshots. We saw kids running towards us. And we still didn't move. We let them run past us and we stayed still because we're like, there's cops around. So they obviously heard that too. And they already know we're here. So we're just going to stay put and let all this stuff happen in front of us while we just stay here and not like do any like no brash movements from us because we know what happens when you start running. Mm. Right. So that was a weird moment where you like just heard gunshots, but you stayed still. That's the kind of like that. And then I went on the road to make all the other photographs by myself in those, those new cities I'd never been to before. So it was a little unnerving, but at the end of the day, um, the pictures showed something like they showed scenes of like normalcy, right? They were like, you were just in the suburbs. It's the suburbs everywhere. The buildings look the same everywhere. Alu- like aluminum siding looks the same everywhere. Like that is what this picture is. You're not, this is not a different place. This is not a ghetto. This is not a hood. This is just a place where everyone knows and it's happening everywhere. So that's what I wanted to show in that series. Mm. For me, it's like I'm so in the mode when I'm doing it, like just on the go. Yeah, like, how do you pre- how do you prep? Like, how do you how, how do you? I'm I'm saying mentally prep. Mentally, like how, yeah. how do you mentally prep? I think it's just like you have to make this work because well, that one was hot. Like I was hired to do that. So mm-hmm. same thing with the Nat Geo. Actually, I was hired to do these things. So yeah, I have a mental backlog of like pictures that you know because I've done my research for so many years. I know what works and what doesn't in a photograph, right? So I tr- I know which angles I need and which angles are not going to work based on the time of day Mm -hmm. so that's what i work with like just kind of that inert like i've i've seen this thing before i know how to do this now so that's kind of how and that's not always good right like i mean i think that you do have to get a little bit more creative and i think that i do fall into traps of like this like this photographer's past these traps where like you're well i'm an architectural photographer so i do it this way Mm -hmm. and i try to break that down sometimes too but usually i fall back into my little motifs but that also is just, you know, part of being an artist. You have to kind of break away from the things you're familiar with. Mm-hmm. If you can break away from the things you're familiar with and people still like your work, then you've done something pretty good. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> so I hope that I can get to that point at some point where I can just kind of completely break away from the things that people know me from completely. And then people are like, still like, oh, that's pretty cool. So that's, you know, that's, that's what, that's what being an artist is about. Trying to, to push that, push those edges, push those borders. Would you mind touching on some of the work you did with Nat Geo? Yeah, so that one one of the series. Well, I've done a bunch of work with Nat Geo now, on the like documentary side and the client side. So, the first job I did was seven days in Richmond and around Richmond, Virginia, photographing the actual like Robert E. Lee, Robert E. Lee, Robert E. All of them, all yeah. of those monuments. But those are all like in graffiti, covered in graffiti. There's people I've seen out. That, uh, it was like yeah. it wasn't. There was it was like a. It's kind of like peaceful protest, really, like because they were just playing. Like people were just out playing basketball and being disruptive, right? Mm-hmm. Like that was the deal. I've seen like people skating on and yeah, on, they on had like a there. tag football game in yeah. the middle of COVID. I was like, that does not seem like you should yeah. be having football in COVID around all these people, even yeah. if it's outside. I hope all of them are alive. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it was just me and my friend uh, Yoav Horesh, who also photographs architectural landscape of problematic history, yeah. but he's from Israel and. He's photographed a lot of Europe, like the problems of Europe, sculptures, and like, so I knew that he was the right person to be with me on that trip, and I was right, because he was just off making his own pictures, and I was like, I don't actually need you to be, like, a, a true assistant, because I want you to be capturing this stuff, too, and, and like, getting scenes that I can see. Like, I always work with photographers that I feel bring something to the table that I do not, so that I can see what they're doing, so that I can be better photographer. <laughs> like, it's like having training. He's a teacher. He knows how to talk. He yeah. can, like... He is like all the people I work with are just true talent. Like that, you could they can talk to you about anything in the world. Like they are broad, you mm-hmm. know. So being with those guys to like make my photographs has been really good. So I did that seven day job in Richmond, photographing a lot of color work. That's called latency. These are all coming into books in like May or June. Southern Horror is the se- the the like black and whites uh, of Confederate monuments. Um, that was the first two jobs, and then I got hired to do three days at Stone Mountain in Virg- in uh, Georgia, which was like a... Stone Mountain is the largest Confederate monument in the world. It's like on the side of a mountain. It's bigger than Mount Rushmore. It's carved into a mountain 
in Virginia, in Georgia, right outside of Atlanta, maybe 10 minutes from Atlanta, mm. which is like the blackest city ever. Yeah. <laughs> but then they have this huge Confederate monument that was like dedicated by the Ku Klux Klan in like, the, I don't know, the 30s or something like that. Yeah. That sculpture was started to be built by the person who made Mount Rushmore. This is a history of America, right? Like this is, it's all connected, right? Um, so I got a three day job doing that, but that was actually for the travel section. And they want, because Stone Mountain is actually like a huge, like, uh, camping grounds and like a huge park, beautiful, beautiful neighborhood. Be- I mean, beautiful place. So I talked to, I was able to talk to like people of color that were staying there and like how they felt about the place. And like some people just didn't even know it was there. Like I, cause you can access the stone, the mountain by not even seeing the front where the Confederate monument is. So a lot of people that were visiting didn't even know didn't that even it was there. That. Wow. They were just there to climb the like eight hundred or six hundred foot Hit rock the trails and, mm-hmm. and all that. Yep. Yeah. So they didn't had even no go idea that, side. that no idea. Was, wow. Yeah. No idea. That's crazy. So that's our world. Yeah. That's our world. Uh, so that was another job, and then I did this job with uh, Kia, uh, where I acted as more. I did photography for it, but I was. I don't know if you've seen the ball drop at Times uh, Times Square, like the number, the letters, like tw- or the numbers twenty twenty one, twenty twenty two. So Kia drives a car from L A to New York at least for the last few years with a, like a, a Telluride Kia truck with a trailer with those numbers on the back as a, like a, a marketing campaign. I was hired to photograph that road trip. Right. Mm. <laughs> but then it was COVID time and like, um, they didn't want me to actually go across state lines with like doing that work. Mm-hmm. So I hired people in LA, Vegas, Miami. And I did the work in New York mm-hmm. video, video people and, and uh, photographers to photograph the truck as well as landscapes and portraits. It was like this huge job Mm. and it was last minute. I mean, they gave me that, they gave me a contract two days before I had to like actually get releases or licenses for location. It was pretty last minute. So that was another job that was pretty stressful, but it was a good, you know, that's a good start to the year when you're getting a private job from Nat Geo. So Mm. I was like, I have to take this. And then I got a job, uh, a job photographing. Oh well, close enough. Kevin Love, you know Kevin yeah, Love. Yeah, for sure, the basketball player. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. plays Cleveland for the Cleveland Cavs. Cavs. Yeah, I don't know if like that's probably some things you don't say in the Pacer town. Hey, they're in our division. It's like, you know, <laughs> they're actually really hot right now. Yeah, they're, they're good. good. Yeah. I mean, like, they those youngins, them youngins, and of yeah. course Kevin Love. Big ups to Kevin Love. I yeah. mean, we. So I was hired uh, again by Nat Geo and Dell to go to Portland's where where. Um, Kevin Love is actually from or like he's from around in in Oregon near Mm -hmm. Portland and we like I I kind of was able to maybe teach him a little about a little bit about photography on video like for a Dell ad a a long elongated 10 minute Dell ad which was half about his struggles with like mental health and like basketball and like half about everything that photographic Mm -hmm. so it was a cool mix to be with him for like a day or two and just like chill and like feel how real he was and to like be on camera feeling that realness was like a a new moment like that was really cool for me so that's kind of i did that i did that work for them too navigating in this world you know you're working with kias and dell and like these big corporations and being an artist and having that you know you're you're working with people you're setting up logistics for for people across the country Mm -hmm. like could you like share a little bit about that aspect of of it to people that you know well first off i'll tell you right now like i can make a photograph but all that other stuff was new to me like i've never hired another i don't usually hire other photographers to do like jobs for huge companies like that but i had to learn on the fly in a day how to do that i had to find photographers that were willing to work during covid last minute Mm -hmm. in all these locations like fly away from their family, like not fly, but like drive away from their families for yeah. a few days to make this work and deal with people and talk to, and you have to find a photographer that can actually make a landscape, a portrait mm-hmm. and a car shot. Like yeah. that is like, and a videographer. It's a lot of moving parts. It's a lot of stuff. Yeah. And I wasn't really prepared for all that yeah. um, at all because I'd never done it before. So I definitely hired a licensing person because I was like, I can't do the licensing and work with the artist at the same time because mm-hmm. I don't know how to do licensing. Mm-hmm. So a friend of mine had a connection to somebody in LA who did licensing for movies mm-hmm. and like getting like location scouting and all that kind of stuff done. So that was a good five grand spend. I mean, like I was like, I didn't care how much it costs to get this person to do it, maybe yeah. five or six grand. And I was like, 
just make it happen. Mm-hmm. Like whatever you can find is is good. I can't be picky. We have a, a three days to make this happen. Yeah. If you can find a actual agreement for us in three to four days, it's unbelievable. So thank you very much. He and he was the man. He did that. So it was good to have him. And then I could work on the photo side, like talking to my artists and saying like we need these types of shots. Mm-hmm. Where can we photograph where we maybe don't need a release because there's just the desert, you know, like yeah. we, how do we photograph in the desert without a release? Like all that kind of information I just had to put together really quickly. I would say that I did it on the fly and there was no way to um, be prepared for it. I would like, and of course, this type of job, you know, it's one of a lifetime. Like, I don't know if I'll ever get a job like that again. So, if I did get a job like that again, I'd probably be in the same spot. Like, oh my god, how do I do this again? You know, like it's not. I won't now. I don't now know how to do that type of job, right? Yeah. This is like if somebody hires me for it, I will have to figure it out on the fly. The oh. only thing I would say is consistent is I know my people that I hired could do the work. Mm. I saw what they've done before. I'm. Yeah. Cons- they are consistent photographers, and even you know, I just had to put my trust in them, and I did because I know them, and I realized like we've been around each other for decades or at least 10 years, all of those guys. So I knew that they could make the work happen. If you have people that you can rely on to do something right, then it makes it way easier. You must have hired me for a reason. Yeah. Right. That's how I feel about my profession. Like, I am going to give you options for every angle, but usually I'm giving you the angle first that, you, that I like, right? And then there's a few other angles, but I'm trying to push the one that I wanted to make at the fir- in the first place. But you have to give clients options, right? That's why you shoot in different backgrounds and different locations. Like if I'm photographing, I was photographing in the winter in New York City. It was snowing. It was like you, we didn't know what we were going to get. We were just out in a park trying to make pictures of two, two dudes. And I was like, yeah, hopefully the sun's good. Hopefully it's not too gray. Hopefully they can use this shot. You know, like it's all that kind of hope and just trying to make photographs and like, I know they only need one of these, so I'm gonna use. I'm gonna take these people to six locations in the same town, in the same like within a half mile of each other, so we can walk it and just figure it out together when we're doing that. Instead of like getting in a car, driving to the next location, getting in a car, driving. So I try to keep things really close so that I can be comfortable with like there will be different backgrounds in this one situation. I try not to overload the day with stuff, right? Like mm-hmm. every day gets one shoot. Never to shoot today because you'll always run over and not get to the second thing and then you're screwed. So it's like, do one thing, try to do it right over the course of many hours when you only need one photograph. And then you can probably like Mm -hmm. give yourself time to figure out like, you will never know what the client wants. They may hate the work, but Mm -hmm. if they, if you only made, you know, maybe you can never get the job again. Right. I mean, it's about like, do you want the job again? If you had to do something that you didn't want to do. Yeah. Like for me, it's like if, if they wanted something that they didn't get, then I wouldn't want to work with them again. That's yeah. how, that's as simple as it is. Like, I, I love money, but if you don't like what I do, then I don't need your money. Mm-hmm. I can't use it because it's just not good money. Mm. But I have a, a kind of privilege in saying that because I've been doing it for a long time. And I, at this point, hope that I will get another job. Even if that person didn't come back, hopefully I can get another job from somebody else. <laughs> totally. if, you're, if, you're, if you're consistent at making a photograph that you feel comfortable with and the person hired you for that, then you should feel comfortable making those photographs for them. Mm. That's what I think. Like, make some options. If I'm photographing you in the studio and you're right in front of me, then I'd photograph you from all sides, a few different backgrounds, looking at me, looking away from me, eyes closed, looking up, looking like just kind of mix it up so that they have options to choose one thing, right? You can't just give them like the one portrait of you looking at me. That's not the one, right? Like, that is never going to be the one. But if you give me 15 options, you usually can get one goodie. Like, that's if I can make, if I make 100 pictures, I'll probably make one decent picture. For a client. So if I make a thousand pictures over the course of a week, or if I'm photographing for a week, it's going to be like more like 10,000 pictures. I can make 10 good ones. Mm. That's a low percentage, mm. but that's enough to get me paid. Chris Grace, <laughs> we're in the studio. We're yes. rapping. Yes. Let's talk about NFTs. NFTs, man. Ooh. That is the hot topic. It seems like the world's hot everything. topic. I don't know if yeah. it, maybe it, it may, you you think it's hot topic too. So obviously it's pushing around. I mean, the world. I feel like the when you open up any social media app um, and it's a timeline, you see in avatars of people's profiles yeah. as a you know the monkeys and the and the apes, the, 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 apes, the, the, the punks, the, yep. the, all the you know and. You know, a lot of people have different opinions on them. A lot of people don't even know and can't even figure out and navigate what it is. Some people think it's just a flash in the pan. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I guess I just and and you are are 
delved deep into this this atmosphere or stratosphere. Totally. totally. Yeah. I see it as this a... world. So I guess I would like to, uh, maybe for those that aren't really familiar um, and mm-hmm. kind of what you what you believe in, in the future and like what yeah, what's so, popping with NFTs. Yeah. So an NFT is the word for the name for that is non fungible token. Right. So what that means is if I give you a dollar and you give me a dollar, it doesn't matter if it's the same dollar, like the exact same dollar. It's just a dollar. And that is a fungible token, right? Like they are interchangeable with each other. And it doesn't matter if your hundred is different than my hundred or whatever. It's the same. It's the same currency. Um, An NFT is a specified like contract that is different than that. So I'm giving you, you're giving me something. It's more of a trade, right? Like the NFT is more of a trade. So you're giving me something and I'm giving you this smart contract, which is an NFT, right? Most NFTs right now are on the Ethereum blockchain, which is a cryptocurrency kind of. Yeah, like it's a it's a blockchain. It's a token, so it doesn't have like a it's not a currency really. It's just a token that tokenizes it's worth something in the US. I mean, this is getting way too complicated, but <laughs> an NFT is pretty much a, a digital scarcity. It's like a a mark of digital scarcity. So if you were to sell a print and you only made one print, that becomes like the one of one that is like in real like on paper that's the only one you'll make and now you if i give it to you it is yours it's the same with an nft like if i make a one of one nft of a piece of art then if i trade you that contract then it's yours to you know sell or put on your wall or on your television screen because that's what the nft is like real like you know that's how it goes for now um so i think it's i think it's the democratization of the art world first off and then soon the democratization of the whole world, meaning I'm learning, I'm seeing people make like a lot of money photographing a, like a, a, a self portrait for a thousand days in a row, just a thousand self portraits, right? That person now made like $3 million because they just made a picture at their computer and people bought into it. They mm-hmm. sold them for $5 originally and now it went to $10, $20, $50, $100, $1,100. And now that's, it's just circulating income for him, Right. I have friends that are selling or photograph. I'm in the photography NFT section. There's mm-hmm. a lot of those like punks and like projects that we can go into, but yeah. that's not my world in it. Yeah, yeah. Um, that is a cool world. I mean, think about it. Those crypto punks, like crypto punks, are one of the first um, NFTs. Not the first, but one of the first from a few years ago, and they're worth pretty much nothing for until last year. Right? There was two years that they were worth in the tens of dollars, maybe like not even a lot. You could get a hundred of them. For like a thousand dollars, like or just like really inexpensive. I don't know the actual prices, mm-hmm. but when the market came and they were like, "Oh, these have some rarity because they were one of the first things that existed in this marketplace." Now you can sell them for like a million dollars, and people really want them. And that's kind of the beauty of uh, a decentralized situation, as as it is. Like, I mean, for artists, I would say everyone should be on it. The people of color need to be on it because. It decentralizes your money. You don't have to. There's no gatekeepers here. You can make your own communities. There's and no sell commissions. It. There's uh, well, pr- there's first off, you. I mean, you have to. You ha- there's money going out the door, right? Like yeah. you can't. You don't own your own platform unless you want to <laughs> design it. Unless you want to learn how to code your own NFT website, which will take a while. You can do that. That's up to you. That's on you. You can do that, but that takes a lot of work and a lot of training. But you can do it. People do it all the time. Make a lot of money doing it, but. The platforms usually take a percentage of the money when you've sold something on the platform, mm. right? So <coughs> a platform like OpenSea, which is like an eBay for NFTs kind of, it's a big secondary market sales. It does primary market sales also, but on the secondary, it's like if you own an NFT or if you produce an NFT, like let's say you're a photographer or an artist, a painter, a drawing. Musician. Musician. I mean, that's coming this year. For yeah. Real. Yeah. Yeah. We're on a radio station. We'll talk about the musician side, right? The NFT photo side is the one thing like where, you know, this year... I started this year or last year in Mar- February, starting to think about NFTs and put like twenty JPEGs from that one of my series online, and you know they some a few of them sold. I made a few thousand dollars, and I was like, "Whoa!" I made a few thousand dollars off JPEGs, but I didn't really understand what I was doing. Like I was like trying to get into it, understood that smart contracts were a thing, which I can't really go into here because it's a long conversation. Mm-hmm. But every every NFT is not just a JPEG; it's the JPEG plus a contract on the back that gives ownership to someone else. That's the connection. So the ownership is what is really important. The JPEG is the is the so people taking a screenshot of of the JPEG or whatever that is doesn't have the t- same 
yeah. file image timestamp. I, th- I would say it this way. I've been using Instagram for a long time to, to like show my work. And I will so I'll continue to show new work on Instagram, but there's no money for me there. I yeah. mean, maybe there's some like followers and likes and yeah. possibly a job here and there, a random thing that I'll get from it. You can't eat on likes. You cannot eat on likes, man. <laughs> I've I, I've done my best to try to eat cannot, off of likes, cannot but pay utilities it is on, an, it is an, on followers. There, there ain't no nutrients. <laughs> so, like with NFT, it's like okay, cool. There's not a lot of people that want to spend five hundred dollars on my artwork, but there may be one person, and if that one person can help me pay rent or you know pay for anything in my like school debt or whatever, then I'm gonna take that money. Like, cause I need it to like survive, right? Like, mm-hmm. this is not a game. This is my career, mm-hmm. and to not have to have a job and to be able to sell art on the internet from my house of work that I made or am making currently is really empowering to me because now I don't need to rely on my on my my well being on someone else's company or something like that. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So for NFT for me is freedom for people, and it could be the freedom for like a lot of people of color, especially artists and art makers like musicians. Imagine like you're signing a record la- a record deal. You're getting one. You're getting one percent of all your record sales. You can sell a million records and make a hundred thousand, ten, ten thousand yeah. dollars, right? If it's, it's, and streaming's even worse, right? Like, yeah, it's like how much money? If fractions you, of a penny. If you st- yeah. do you know if you stream like ten million times, how much money does a person usually make off ten million streams? Like, ten million streams, you might get like uh like a thousand dollars. Yeah, think about that. Yeah, that is insane. Like, who gets 10 million streams? Like, that's not even... Uh, like, Drake. I mean, yeah. he's getting, like, 80 million streams or I something. Know. And he's but... still only making 100 grand on the... He probably has a better record deal than we think he does. Yeah, like, for sure. But he's still only making, like, 100 grand off streams. Yeah. Um, I think it was... I, I, I can't remember the artist, but just recently broke down the, the streaming to royalty ratio on mm-hmm. all the platforms from, you know, any streaming platform. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's it's comical, yeah. So it's it's and it's it's crazy how artists are striving to be on these platforms like the Spotify or the Apple Music, where that like s- gives you legitimacy as a, a musician and an artist because you are seen in this world. But this yeah. world does not give you no it gives the you, means to yeah, to, yeah. to to sur- to to live. Mm-hmm. You know, and that sounds just like Instagram to me. Yeah, for sure, one hundred percent. Yeah. So when you when you think about like if a musician was like okay, think if a musician has ten thousand followers, yeah, right? and let's say one percent, one percent, one percent, let's say ten percent of those people actually want to support the musician in a way, yeah. and they want to pet, spend a dollar per song for twelve songs in their record. Yeah, that means twelve dollars times ten thousand. That's one hundred twenty thousand dollars a year that you can make as an NFT if you sold your image, like your music as NFTs instead mm. of through a record label. Yeah, and that's so going, now you have that's more control. Now you have yeah. one hundred twenty thousand dollars, full control of your records forever. You get royalties of five to ten percent, or whatever you choose on yeah. the NFT side. So now, if somebody resells it for a dollar, then you make ten ten cents off that, which mm-hmm. is still more than a, a stream. Mm-hmm. So that's where I see like artists can say like, well, if I have a hundred thousand followers, I can probably monetize that into a million dollars pretty easily if I make an album per year and that has twelve to fourteen tracks on it and they cost seventy five cents. Mm. So for yeah. me, it's like just the math alone makes sense to try. Yeah. So that's what I do in the photography side. Like if I make my put my new series online of a hundred, well, what I did with the Southern Horror for this is kind of an NFT show because it. For it start like no one's seen it until it was NFTs like this Southern Horror show. Mm-hmm. There were a few in the magazine. I had this twenty four page spread in Nat Geo in this last February. Yeah, but um, besides just a few of the images being in that spread, the hundred seventy five exists as NFT and nowhere else. Right. So this show is the first time or the second time in print that you'd be able to see them. The first time I had a show in uh, three weeks ago, or it ended two weeks ago in uh, Wright State University mm-hmm. in, in Dayton. Uh, in Dayton. Yeah, yeah. So I was up there. I've been in the Midwest for a while now, baby. Yeah, you're I'm like, I'm traveling around, man. I, yeah. I love it. I love it. I love Detroit. I love Chicago. I'm feeling Indianapolis. I'm, yeah. I'm having a good time out here. It's a, it's a different type of, it's different than New York. New York's too fast. It's just way too fast. And here it feels like I can actually like think about work in a different way and yeah. feel the place. So, so yeah, this is like an NFT show. And, um, what I did was I pre-sold it, right? I had a few, like I had like maybe five or six people that were collectors of mine. And I was like, and I used Twitter, and I said, "Hey, I'm putting 175 uh, images on OpenSea. 
if you buy them before I release, I'm going to release, release them in September 1st. And for the first, for the two weeks of the last two weeks of August, I'm going to make them 10% off if you want them. Mm. Like, so you have to give me the money and I'll send you the files without them being lo- live on the site yet. Mm. They were just exist. And then people are like, I'll buy one. I'll buy eight. I'll buy 10. I'll buy 50. And then I was like, cool. That's in- that's like my income for a year, right? Like I made forty thousand dollars on those images online in two weeks before they re- were released to the public. And then when they released to the public, there was ten left out of one hundred seventy five, and those sold within an- a few hours. Mm. This is just building community around yourself. I didn't try to do this. I don't have a huge community now. I have a bigger one, but like then I didn't have much. I had a few buyers and uh, and Twitter and a dream, and that's it. You know, like so I think that it can work that way for a lot of people if they just put in the work to build a community for themselves. But uh, no one else is going to do it for you. That's not yeah. happening. You have to do it yourself. Non fungible tokens. NFTs. I mean, this is the world. Like, if you're if you're drawing something and you think if you're a tattoo artist, I mean, that's oh, that's the game right there. I didn't even think about that <laughs> because there's a tattoo spot right across the street. It's right across the street. Yeah. And I was like, there's so many drawings in there. Yeah. Sell them all for two dollars, five dollars is an NFT. Then you're selling your work so that other people can draw it. Yeah. And now it's like, okay, cool. I want that tattoo. We're at a tattoo artist in the blockchain. You're selling each tattoo you've made in the past for $100. Now it's like if you have a 1,000 of those, you can make a lot of money selling your cl- – they can take mm-hmm. it for free, of course, but this is all this is all promotion, right? This is all, this is all promotion. Yeah. Like even if somebody takes it, a JPEG, steals a JPEG for free and puts your tattoo on their arm, Yeah. that's still yours. Build in your – build in your um, – as long as you're like somebody who does something more original with tattoos, then mm-hmm. you can see what people have done, and hopefully they use your hashtag on a on a on an Instagram message or Twitter so that they can push back to your open C page so you can sell yeah. another one. I mean, this is the circle of like life here. Yeah, Chris Graves. Yo, ninety nine point one FM, <laughs> WQRT, Indianapolis. Yeah. Where can people get in touch with you? See your work? Why don't you uh, shout out? Uh, I, yeah, your, some URLs. Yeah, I'm a public human being, so you can find me um, on Instagram and Twitter at at KGPNYC. We can leave it at that, because if you go to there, you'll find everything else. KGPNYC, you type that in anywhere, I promise it will come up with something of mine. That's like book companies or my own photography or uh, or the NFT game. So all of that stuff, KGPNYC, 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 KGPNYC. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Yo, thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, yeah.